lost a little bit this time is just because I am Things just seem to feel a little bit different, you understand Believe it or not, but life is not apparently And to that uh, joyous music, I welcome you to our service here at New Life Church in Toulon, Manitoba. My name is Henry Ozerny, and I'm the interim pastor here at New Life. It's good to have you along with us today, and we're looking forward to a good time of fellowship and worshiping the Lord together uh, via this uh, technologi technological process on our YouTube channel. Our theme today is self-gratification. And uh, that lively song that I started off this service with, we're going to hear it all uh, by Mercy Me, so listen to it, So Long Self. And here's how it goes. It's just because I am Things just seem to feel a little bit different You understand? Believe it or not, but life is not apparently
Well, that is So Long Self by Mercy Me. Great song. I love the words to it. Our scripture reading uh, this morning is from James chapter 4, or the first five verses, and I'm reading this out of the New International Version. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires, a battle within you? You want something, but don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend it, spend what you get on your pleasures. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity with God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think scripture says without reason that the spirit he caused to live in us envies intensely. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Join with me as we pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you this morning for the opportunity to gather together around the um, computer screen and to be able to worship you and learn from you in this manner. We thank you for everyone who has tuned in and we ask that this blessing that I'm praying for will fall upon each person. We thank you for your Holy Spirit that does guide and lead us into truth and we pray today that may happen for each of us. So we just commit this service to you. We pray your blessing on it. We ask this in the strong and a powerful name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning, I'm going to do something just a little bit different, and that is we're going to have a song that is aimed right at the kids. Um, it's called the Selfishness Song for Kids, put together by Hilltop City Life Christian Channel. And uh, my wife and I were talking, and she said, you know, a lot of kids watch the church services. Let's have something for the kids today. And so this is a song for all of you kids, and all of you older kids will enjoy it as well. Watch the selfish, Selfishness Song for Kids. Burp, burp, who ate all the cake? You know the cake that I didn't help you make Moan, groan, my tummy's twice the size Groan, moan, cause I ate all the pies I don't want to share cause it's less for me Go and get your own, these are my sweeties If you don't give me yours, I won't be a friend Don't people like that just drive you round the bend But a selfishness song for kids actually uh, I think all of us enjoyed it great song in terms of announcements we just want to remind you that we're still under code red as established by the government of Manitoba and that means we will not be meeting for services or Bible studies until that is lifted and we don't know how long that'll be uh, I'll ask you to pray that God would bring this pandemic to a soon end uh, but then in the meantime, as I have on the PowerPoint there, that his praise and glory, his glory in his name would be exalted in all of this. And uh, my prayer is that uh, it'll be lifted, that we could at least enjoy some Christmas uh, services here in about a month. 
So we trust the Lord for that. One of the uh, young ladies here in our congregation, Lori Ben, has a beautiful voice with which she ministers in song. You will recall perhaps several months ago, uh, actually during the summer, uh, Lori sang a song here. And this is a photo actually from her doing that uh, song. It was um, uh, such a blessing to us. And she contacted me and she said, Pastor Ronnie, I'm willing to do another one. And so I said, that's great. She sent along some artwork she had done, and so I'm going to use that as a backdrop as she sings that well-known Christian hymn, Amazing Grace. Lori Ben with the song Amazing Grace. Thank you, Lori. Well done. And you can see there the artwork uh, on uh, the screen uh, that she painted. Uh, actually, the Sarah Young's book, Jesus Calling, is kind of the basis of that um, piece of art. It was in the year 2002 that the movie About a Boy was released and it featured Hugh Grant. And they did an interview with Hugh Grant shortly after the movie was over. And uh, Grant said in that interview, in many ways, Nick Hornby, and Hornby was the writer of the book of the, that the movie was based on, said, uh, Hornby always writes about my life because no one is more accurate about the London contemporary male life, particularly in terms of my, uh, that part of my life before four weddings and a funeral, another movie that uh, Grant had started. I, I didn't have much work. I had a little bit of money for, from doing some rather strange films, but most of the year 
was actually spent doing absolutely nothing, watching afternoon television, playing snooker, and all the things that this character is up to. Well, that uh, movie was uh, reviewed in the Winnipeg Free Press, and one uh, writer in the Free Press put it this way, Grant says he also understood how a life devoted to self-gratification can get old. That seductive and fun bachelor existence suddenly beginning to pale towards the end of your 30s. I was familiar with and intrigued by that aspect, he says. It's the feeling of, is this still as great as it was when you were in the 20s, or is there something missing? Well, what Grant was dealing with in his life is the title of my sermon, The Passion for Self-Gratification. I want to look at that this morning. The Westminster Catechism makes the profound statement when it says, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. And that tells us the purpose of our existence. We have been created to bring glory to God. That's why Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, every part of your life, do everything for the glory of God. Now, while Westminster Catechism says that, unfortunately, a lot of people would not say that the chief end of their lives is to glorify God. Rather, they would say something like that the chief end of their life is to be happy and to gratify gratify their pleasure-seeking instincts, that is, to have fun. In a recent survey of Canadian Christian teenagers, they were asked, and uh, some guys, uh, well, I, th I think teenagers in, in general, not just boys, but uh, they were asked, what's the most important to you? And the answer that was most commonly given was that they wanted to have fun, have a good time. And they said that God was number five or number six on their list of what was most important to them. This is Canadian Christian teenagers. Well, this morning I want to look at the topic of self-gratification and what the book of James has to say about it. And so this morning, that's, as I said, is the title of my message, The Passion for Self-Gratification. And I'm going to pray before we look at what James has to say. Father in heaven, we thank you for your word. Once again, as we look at it, we pray that your Holy Spirit will come in and just minister to us. We open ourselves to receive the truth. I stand against all the forces of darkness, command every evil spirit in the strong name of Jesus to go. And the Holy Spirit, I invite you here. Just take this message and apply it to our lives. Help us to be focused on bring, bring glory and praise to you and not gratifying our own personal sinful life, selves. So we just thank you for this time. We ask this in the name of Jesus and for his honor and glory. Amen. James begins by talking about self-gratification being the cause of quarrels and conflicts. And James is saying that people have quarrels and conflicts in their lives because they make their desires the aim in life. Notice how James puts it in chapter 4, verse 1. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? Now, the word that the New International Version, which is the translation that I'm using here this morning, uh, uses um, is desires. And it's variously translated. If you have a King James Version, for example, it'll say uh, uh, lusts. Uh, the English Standard Version will have the word passions. New American Standard Bible will say pleasures. And the New Revised Standard Version, cravings. These are all English words to try to uh, explain what the original Greek word was. Actually, the Greek word originally was hedonos, and which is actually the root word for the English word hedonism. <clears throat> and hedonism, of course, is the uh, uh, philosophy of life, the view that pleasure is to be our chief aim in life. And indeed, this was the philosophy of Hugh Hefner who brought pornography into mainstream in North America. Uh, some time ago, they had the 50th celebration for Playboy, and in Time magazine, Michael Farkash uh, commented on that gala celebration, and uh, he made this statement in that article in Time magazine, as the celebration proves, hedonism still sells. Well, that's the philosophy that uh, Hefner lived under, and it is the root word here in our text, our desires, our hedonism within us. 
You see, according to the text, as you notice it goes on to say, don't they come from your desires that battle within you? We have these desires for self-gratification within us because of the very core of our beings, we are selfish and self-centered. If you look into your heart and into mine too, you will see three words, I, me, myself. That's what we live for. We our minds are dominated by these things. As a matter of fact, it can get so bad that sometimes we begin to thinking that the whole world revolves around us. And we tell ourselves in the very popular phrase, <coughs> excuse me, that is, con uh, that is used, uh, it's all about me. I love the cartoons of Calvin and Hobbes. And in one of these cartoons, uh, Calvin says to Hobbes, now Hobbes is his uh, stuffed animal who comes to life in um, Calvin's mind. And Calvin says to Hobbes, people are so self-centered. And he goes on to say, the world would be a better place if people would just stop thinking about themselves and focus on others for a change. And uh, then Hobbes scratches his head and says, gee, I wonder who that might apply to. Of course, you, th you know which way Hobbes is thinking about that. Well, Calvin responds by saying, me, everybody should focus on me. So this idea of our self-centered nature dominates ourselves. And admittedly, when we look at that self-centered nature, part of that is rooted in our basic instinct for self-preservation. Uh, uh, I think about myself because I want to continue uh, living, living safely, and so if I'm, my life is endangered, obviously that desire for self-preservation uh, is there. But because of that, and because I'm programmed in that way, then it just comes naturally, naturally for me to think about myself first. It's just second nature for me to think about me first. But as I, as I thought about this, the problem is that not only do I think of myself first, my problem is that so often times I think only of myself. I get together with a group of people and inside of myself I'm thinking like, how do I look? How do I feel? What are they thinking about me? And uh, that's the way we look at our relationships. Now, uh, you may think, well, Henry, wow. Well, let me say this. You're doing the same thing. Uh, while I'm thinking about myself, you're thinking about yourself in the same way. That's the uh, human condition, we could say. As Proverbs 28, 25 in today's English version puts it, selfishness only causes trouble. You're much better off to trust the Lord. And so because of that selfishness within us, that tendency in our hearts, we clash. Uh, selfishness is the seed of all conflict. And that's what he says. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? And then in verse 2, he goes on to say, you want something, but don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and you fight. Well, the statement here in Scripture is essentially telling us that within a conflict is rooted at the core of its being, with each of us having a selfish heart. Uh, today's English version says you want things, but you cannot have them, so you're ready to kill. You strongly desire things, but you cannot get them, so you quarrel and fight. You know, so many uh, uh, of, the hum uh, of the family conflicts that we have are due to the fact that people are seeking self-gratification. And so my desires run counter to those of my wife's, and her desires run counter to those of me. And so because of that, there's constant conflict in, in relationships, and for sure in many families. As a matter of fact, you know, as a pastor for many years, one of the things that never ceases to amaze me is the enormous amount of conflict that we as human beings often engage in. And as I said, oftentimes in the family. Some time ago, I came across a story about a boy who was uh, oh, eight, nine years old doing his homework and one evening uh, he went to his dad and he asked his father the question. He said, uh, Dad, he said, how do wars get started? Well, his father responded uh, by saying, well, World War II began because Germany invaded Belgium. Well, the mother was in the room and she piped up. She said, no, it wasn't Belgium. It was Germany that attacked Poland. And the father responded, no. He said, I, I'm sure I remember correctly, it was Belgium. And then he went on to say to his wife, well, what do you know about it? You didn't go to college. I did. And I minored in world history. 
And he said to her quite strongly and adamantly, I tell you, the war began when Germany invaded Belgium. Well, the woman got angry and left the room, slammed the door, and the boy said to his dad, okay, that's okay, dad. You don't need to tell me now. I know, I think I know how wars begin. Well, James is saying that because people want gratification of their desires so badly, they'll do almost anything to get it. He goes even to say, uh, even murder. He says this, you um, want something but don't get it. You kill and you covet, but you cannot have what you want. Philip's uh, New Testament uh, translates that you crave for something and don't get it. You are jealous and envious of what others have and you don't possess uh, it yourselves. Consequently, in exasperated frustration, you struggle and fight with one another. And some pretty strong language there. Uh, a tragic story I came across some time ago um, about a father who, I don't know what he was trying to sleep or whatever, and he had a little baby boy. And uh, because the baby's crying bugged him so much, he killed the child. Now, that's a classic illustration, I mean an extreme illustration of this whole attitude. It bugs me, so I'll kill the child. Now, it says in the latter part of verse 2, James says this, um, you, um, uh, well, let me read verse 2 in its entirety. You want something, but don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And so even though they hunger for self-gratification, they just can't achieve it. Uh, you see, here's a powerful statement. The pursuit of pleasure and fulfillment in life while leaving God out is destined to futility. You know... Uh, you remember those of you as kids, or maybe if you're kids watching, you, you do it now. You remember, we used to blow bubbles, and you'd get that little thing, and you'd blow the bubble, and then we'd chase it. And just at the time uh, you caught the bubble and, and grabbed it, it would burst. Well, that's the way for many people their lives and their pursuit of pleasure and fulfillment is. That was the experience of Solomon in the Old Testament as he wrote about his personal experience in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 10 and 11, he said, I denied myself nothing my eyes desired. Of course, he was king, fabulously wealthy, and had uh, the option for whatever he uh, pursued. He, and he said, um, I refused my heart no pleasure. My heart took delight in all my work, and this was a reward of my labor. But notice then his, he let, stands back and looks at life, and he says yes, this, Yet when I surveyed all my hands had done and what I had toiled to achieve, everything was meaningless. A chasing after the wind, nothing was gained under the sun. And so the Solomon's experience is similar to what James is saying here about people who pursue self-gratification. They never find it. It's because they're looking for satisfaction in all the wrong places. In other words, they look at their lives and they see that sense of emptiness and a lack of fulfillment still there. And they begin to say to themselves, there's got to be more to life than what I'm going through. Supermodel Naomi Cam Campbell uh, confessed, she said, I was traveling all over, over the world, and yet I was asking myself, why am I still so unhappy? Uh, Elvis Presley, the famous rock and roll singer back in the 1960s and 70s, said, fame, fortune, and happiness. I've got the first two, but not the last one. Back uh, a number of years ago, a, a very popular music uh, rock group was Queen. And the lead singer for Queen was a fellow by the name of Freddie Mercury. And in an interview, Mercury made this very significant statement one time. He said, you can have everything in the world and still be the loneliest man. And he went on to say this, success has brought me world idolization and millions of fans, but it's prevented me from having the one thing we all need, a loving, ongoing relationship. Now, obviously, in the context, I have to say this, he's talking about a relationship with a female, but in, in terms of the core of his being, really, no female even could satisfy Freddie Mercury's deepest needs at the core of his being. And that's because he, like you and I, needed, need to recognize that true fulfillment in life comes only from knowing the God who planned us and created us for us to be, and for us to have a personal relationship with him. Colossians uh, 1, 16 and 17, um, for everything, absolutely everything, and above and below, visible and invisible, 
everything got started in him, Jesus is the context here, and finds its purpose in him. It is in Christ that we find out who we are and what we're living for. Part of the overall purpose, he's working out in everything and everyone. Andrei Bitov was a Russian novelist, and he grew up under the uh, atheistic communist regime. It was in 1991 that communism fell uh, in the Soviet Union. But he tells in his life uh, earlier to that, he said it was in his 27th year, he said, while riding the metro in Leningrad, I was so overcome with a despair so great that seemed that life seemed to stop at once, preempting the future entirely, let alone any meaning. And suddenly, all by itself, a phrase appeared. Without God, life makes no sense at all. And then Bitov goes on to say, repeating it in astonishment, I rode the phrase up like a moving staircase, got out of the metro, and walked into God's light. Well, here's my question to you. What about you? What are you doing on earth? What is the purpose of your life? Is the reason you live and the th driving dynamic of your life to bring glory to God? Is that why you're living? You see, that is the realization each and every one of us has to come to, that God is the only one who can bring us true, lasting satisfaction in life. Because he's the one who created us, he's the one who designed us, and he alone gives purpose and meaning in life. Nothing else works. And so we need to learn to say, it's not all about me, it's all about you, God. Well, James, in verse 3 and following, goes on to make the claim that the passion for self-gratification nullifies prayer. And notice how uh, he puts it there. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Now, there are some people who will say, you know, I have asked God for everything, but I've not received anything from him. Why not? And what James is saying here in his text, he says, you ask, but you receive not, is because you're asking with the wrong motives. I like this cartoon where the guy is praying on his bedside and he's saying to God, I don't ask for much, but what I get should be a very good quality. Well, the idea that James is communicating is that selfishness hinders prayer. That's, as a matter of fact, how the Amplified Bible translates this phrase. And you see the picture here of the girl taking a selfie as the backdrop to that scripture. And that's why he says, uh, when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives. And the wrong motive, he says, is to spend what we get on our pleasures. Um, a uh, pastor friend of mine was telling me the story uh, some time ago about a man who had come to him with a prayer request. And he said he had just purchased a lottery ticket that was going to win him $100,000. Uh, I think it was $10,000, $100,000, whatever. And he said, uh, I want you to pray that my number will be picked. And he said, he said to the pastor, then I'm going to give one-tenth of my winnings to the Lord. I've had that said more than once to me over the years and people uh, rationalizing away why they, uh, um, it was okay for them to buy lottery tickets. Well, this particular pastor said to the man, he said, well, all right, but first let me ask you this. Are you willing to give the God, to God the same percentage of your present weekly income? In other words, uh, if you're going to give one-tenth uh, one of the 10,000 that you're going to win, what about giving one-tenth of the you know, 700 that you earn every month? And he said the fellow stammered back in response. He said, but, 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 but I need that money to live on. Well, my friend made the observation afterwards essentially was that uh, this man's seeming uh, spiritual request was merely a cover-up for selfishness. He was wanting that prayer answered, mainly because he was looking forward to the 90,000 that he was going to get out of that for himself. Now, on the converse, the right motive is to pray with God's glory in mind. If you read in the book of Isaiah, chapter 37, the Assyrians surround the uh, city of Jerusalem. And uh, at that point in time, um, uh, because of the danger that reflects, uh, that creates, uh, uh, was causing the uh, 
um, Israel, Israelites living in Jerusalem, the king, Hezekiah, prayed this prayer. He says to God, oh, now, o Lord, our God, rescue us from the Assyrians so that all the nations of the world will know that you alone are God. In other words, he asked with the glory of God in mind. He could have said, Lord, uh, rescue us from the Assyrians so that they don't kill us. Well, obviously, that's part of it. But he was saying, Lord, when you step in on our behalf, everybody's going to notice this, and you're going to be glorified. See, that's the way our prayers need to be directed towards God, with the idea that if he answers his prayer, he's going to be glorified. And that my motive is the glory of God, not the particular thing necessarily I want. No, I can want something. For sure, Hezekiah didn't want him and his people killed. But he came at the prayer request with the idea of people all around the world hearing, wow, do you know how God delivered? Actually, if you read that story, a very fascinating story. Uh, there's an army of a couple hundred thousand men just all around the city of Jerusalem. And if you read uh, Isaiah 37 and 38, uh, you will uh, find the story there how that um, uh, during the middle of the night, uh, an angel of the Lord, it says, comes and uh, a, a plague comes upon the soldiers. Maybe they had food poisoning, who knows? And uh, the next morning, the, the uh, king uh, uh, of the Assyrian, Sennacherib, wakes up and all his soldiers are dead. And um, he uh, departs. And this uh, spreads throughout the whole world, how God uh, intervened in this amazing way as in response to Hezekiah's prayer. Now, when it comes to asking for something, uh, let me point this out. You know, here's two people asking for the same thing. And they're praying for a million dollars. And uh, it's interesting, one of these guys will get what he asks for, and the other guy will not get what he asks for. And really, the reason one gets it and the other one doesn't is because of their motives. Their motive um, will be to... All right, we had a little bit of a uh, glitch there. The phone rang, and uh, as a result of that, um, we stopped the video. So back to what I was saying. Um, there's two people asking for the same thing from God, uh, and I put in here a million dollars, uh, and one gets the answer from God, yes, and the other one gets the answer from God, no. And it all goes back to the motive. The motive, of course, of the one who gets a yes is he's asking with the motive of building God's kingdom, of seeking God's glory in one way or the other. Whereas the other fellow, his motive is to satisfy his cravings. Maybe he wants a new car, he'd like a motorhome, maybe a motorcycle, whatever. And it's your motive that determines whether your prayers are answered or not. It was a, uh, a tremendous leader um, in the um, Christian community Oh, well over about 150 years ago by the name of George Mueller. And George Mueller uh, began a ministry building an orphanage in Bristol, England. There was a lot of orphans uh, in England at that time, and M Mueller felt a sense of urgency to help these orphans. And uh, as a matter of fact, uh, when I was in Bristol, England a number of years ago, this is the picture I took of that same orphanage. It's now a technical college. Um, of course, nowadays they don't have orphanages. People, uh, usually it's the foster care system that operates. But in that day, um, Mueller built this orphanage. And uh, he operated under a basic principle, the providing for the expenses of running that orphanage, was he would never ask anybody to give money. He would simply pray and ask God to provide. And he believed, as I put it there in the PowerPoint, you see, uh, was that God would provide everything they needed without anybody saying, okay, I'll support you or asking for money. Uh, and he would do it also without ever going into debt. And all that he was going to do was going to pray and ask God, and he believed God would provide. Well, the result of George Mueller's life of uh, working with these orphans, and I found online some old pictures of some of those children uh, that grew up in those orphanages and were raised in them. That over the years, uh, the orphanage cared for and educated over 18,000 children. And uh, Mueller saw to it that another 100,000 more, over 100,000 more children were educated in other schools at the orphanage's uh, expense. Uh, 
Uh, he himself oversaw the distribution of hundreds of thousands of Bibles, tens of millions of re uh, religious tracts, and supported about 150 missionaries. He himself traveled over 200,000 miles as a missionary, sharing the gospel with over 3 million people around the world. And this was done in the day and age before airplanes. And the um, um, life that he lived and his ministry he carried out, it was said afterwards that he never asked for one penny from anyone and that the children in his orphanages never missed a meal and he never had a debt. And someone did some calculation and discovered that George Mueller asked for in prayer and received from God in direct answer to those prayers, seven million five hundred thousand dollars. Now that's in nine, that's in eighteen sixty dollars. You can probably multiply that by fifteen, twenty, thirty times today. They said when he died, um, his personal estate was about seven hundred dollars, and someone calculated it said that's about one millionth of what he had asked for in prayer. I remember hearing the story of Dwight Lyman Moody, uh, who served as a famous evangelist back to, uh, in that same period of time, 1837 to 1899. And uh, through his work, um, the school Moody Bible Institute was founded, which still is to this day. Here's a picture of Moody Bible Institute to this day. And he also uh, founded a church, it's today uh, still there uh, uh, in Chicago, uh, called Moody Memorial Church. Uh, I think they just call it Moody Church now. And uh, my friend Erwin Lutzer pastored there for many years. And um, uh, 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 R.B. Lakin put it this way, $4 million passed through Moody's hands, but he said it passed through, it didn't stick. And you see, that's the kind of person who gets answers to prayer. He prays with the right motive, and then the motive is never to be gratifying yourself but rather to glorify God. And then uh, James concludes by making this very significant statement, and that is that pa the passion for self-gratification is abhorrent to God. Notice how it puts it in verse 4 and following, verse 4 and 5. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Or do you think the scripture says without reason that the spirit he caused to live in us envies intensely? Um, James's point is that when we live to gratify ourselves, we end up becoming what he calls a friend of the world. We become a friend of the world. Now, um, the reason why we become a friend of the world is because the mindset of the world is one, of course, of self-gratification. And so when I live to gratify myself, I'm living just the way the world around me lives. Now, when it talks about becoming a friend of the world, that word world is used in various ways in scripture, and I need to delineate in which way it's being used in this passage here. For example, sometimes when the Bible uses the word world, it can talk about planet Earth itself. Uh, that's the way it's uh, using the word world here in Romans 1.20, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood for what has been made, so that men are without excuse. So he's talking about planet Earth, um, the world we live on. The second way that the word world is used, it can refer to the human race. Uh, and that's the way John 3.16 talks about it. For God so loved the world. It means the human race. That he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So that you and I are part of that world because we are humans, we live on it. But the third way, and the way that it's used here in our text, the word world here refers to the world of human beings who are estranged from God by their sin and who are regulated by principles contrary to God's word and are devoted to purposes other than that of God's glory. Uh, that's why in 1 John 3.13, uh, the apostle John writes, so don't be surprised, dear brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. Now, these are people who hate us. Obviously, the planet Earth doesn't hate us. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> and it's people who have a certain perspective. Now, uh, when it uses the word world, it has here 
uh, the idea of a system that has been organized by Satan to be in direct opposition to God. Uh, for example, Jesus talked about Satan and said that now the time for judgment uh, now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. The prince of the, this world, of course, talking about is the devil. And so the world system is run by the devil, and people who f who are in rebellion against God are part of his system, and the whole world operates in this anti-God mindset. And so it's in this sense that James is using the word world. And so because of that, the mindset of a worldly person is self-centered. Notice Ephesians 2, 2. Uh, Paul writes, you used to live like, just like the rest of the world, full of sin, obeying Satan, the mighty prince of the power of the air. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. Uh, he goes on to say in verse 3, and all of us used to live that way, uh, following the passions and desires of our evil heart. We were born with an evil nature, and we were under God's anger, just like everyone else. Uh, Chuck Swindoll said he saw a cartoon, and I've actually used this cartoon, I've drawn it myself, um, of a kind of like a statue or an altar comprising of the three words, I, me, myself, and person bowing down before it. And at the bottom of the cartoon, it said, speaking of American cults, that's the big cult in our world today. Um, I, me, myself. Now, when we as Christians then choose to live to gratify self, we become conformed to the world and not to Christ. That's why in Romans 15, verse 3, the first part of verse 3, Paul says, even Christ did not live to please himself. He did not choose a life of self-gratification. And uh, so to clarify this further, James adopts the analogy of marriage. And notice how he puts it in verse 4. You adulterous people. And what James does is he describes a person who's too closely committed to the values of this system called the world as being adulterers, you adulterous people. And the picture there is like a man abandoning his wife for an adulterous relationship with another woman. So in the same way, when we as Christians align ourselves too closely with the world's way of thinking and living, we commit adultery against God. And our Lord feels the same pain that a wife whose husband walks out on her and goes for another woman feels. Someone has put it this way, a woman cultivating the friendship of a man who is trying to seduce her becomes her husband's enemy as such. And so uh, 1 John 2, 15 through 17 says, do not love the world or say anything in the world. But if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, um, and the boasting of what he has and does comes not from the Father, but from the world. And the world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. Dwight L. Moody said, if I walk with the world, I can't walk with God. C.H. Spurgeon, another great uh, church leader, uh, about the same time that Moody was uh, ministering, put it this way, one reason the church has so little influence over the world is because the world has so much influence over the church. Sadly, that's so true. So I'm going to put it this way, as a true follower of Christ, I refuse to entertain myself with the things that my Lord went to the cross for. And that's so true. I refuse to live a worldly lifestyle. And then finally, we need to realize that God is a jealous God. And notice how he puts it in verse 5. He says this. Um, Do you think the scripture says without reason that the spirit has, he causes to live within us envies intensely? Um, the idea there, envy or jealous. Now, we get this idea of jealousy of being a characteristic of God right back in the Old Testament. For example, Exodus 34, 14. Do not worship any other God for the Lord whose name is Jealous is a jealous God. Uh, the Living Bible translates that, for you must worship no other gods but only the Lord, for he is a God who claims absolute loyalty and exclusive devotion. New Living Translation says, never worship any other God because the Lord is a God who does not tolerate rivals. In fact, he is known for not tolerating rivals. 
Now, this idea that God is a jealous God, some people have struggled with this idea of God being jealous. I like this uh, little thing I came across the internet the other day, is God jealous? And you see here these two little kids, the little boy is kissing the girl on his right and the girl on his left doesn't look too impressed by that. A number of years ago, I uh, remember watching uh, Oprah Winfrey on her television program, and uh, she was interviewing somebody, and uh, uh, she ended up telling the story of her childhood or young, as a young woman going to a church um, uh, in, uh, where, in the community where she, uh, she grew up, and she put it this way, the church that I went to had a really charismatic pastor. You had to show up early to get a seat. And I remember sitting there one Sunday while he was preaching about how the Lord thy God is a jealous God. The Lord thy God will punish you for your sins. And I looked around and thought, why would God be jealous? What does that mean? And I'm looking at people in the church and everybody's up shouting. And Oprah Winfrey goes on to say that that was the turning point in her life, turning away and walking out of the church. She said, I can't conceive of God being jealous. How, how terrible is that? And she puts it this way, and I started wondering how many of these people, including myself, would be led to do whatever this preacher said. That's when I started exploring, taking God out of the box, out of the pew, and eventually I got to where I was able to see God and other people and other things in graciousness and kindness and generosity and the spirit of things. Well, this idea of the jealousy of God um, really was a stumbling block to her, but it's really a biblical concept. And let me explain why I say that. You see, the idea, the idea of jealousy is that it's simply concerned for being displaced by someone or something else. The Hebrew word that's translated jealous in the Bible is kana. And um, kana literally means, if you take it literally, it means to be intensely red in the face. Uh, reminds me of one of the uh, most uh, painful nights of my life when uh, I was still in Bible college and um, uh, at that point in time um, my uh, girlfriend, well uh, I shouldn't call her girlfriend then, I, I, I really um, uh, had fallen in love with uh, the, the girl who is now my wife, Linda, and uh, but we were uh, you know, I hadn't really officially started dating or anything, and this uh, slimy guy that uh, was uh, really interested in her, and her uh, I call him Frank, um, I remember we had the Christmas banquet, and after the Christmas banquet, I watched him as he came, and he put his arm around her and uh, escorted her out of the dining room. Well, I'll tell you what, th uh, that evening, I experienced Kana. That was a tough night for me. Uh, fortunately, as I've said before, I won the Linda lottery and Frank lost, which is okay with me. Uh, here's my point in all of this and for saying this, that if a husband is not bothered by jealousy, I should have had the why there at the end of the word jealousy, jealous. When another man makes a play for his wife, you can question whether or not he truly loves her. In other words, if I was talking to Oprah Winfrey, I'd say, if your husband isn't jealous because another guy is coming and making a play on you, then does he really love you? And God is very, very jealous of us. He wants our heart's devotion. It makes all the sense in the world. Why would you walk out of church because of that? doesn't make any sense. You see, God does not want us to move in with the world, but rather he wants us to live and to love with him, to walk through the days of our lives with him by our side. And so I want you to look at your own life and ask yourself, is my life characterized by the pursuit of self-gratification? Is that what you are going for? Would you have to say, yeah, Henry, I think it is. Or would you be able to say, no, no, it's not. It's not self-gratification. I trust it's not. If it is, then I want you to repent of that. Ask God to forgive you for living your life with the goal of gratifying yourself. And then make the commitment today to rather glorify God, like the Westminster Catechism says, to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. The woman who was born blind and uh, deaf and could not speak, Helen Keller, um, once she was able, she was taught to communicate, made this profound statement. She put it this way, true happiness is not attained through self-gratification, but through fidelity to a worthy purpose. And I want to suggest to you this morning that worthy purpose is glorifying God 
with all of your life. And as it's the scripture which I quoted earlier on, 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And may it, in your life, it, you're, you're not saying it's all about me, but rather you're saying it's all about God. Lord God, we thank you for the opportunity to uh, look at your word, and I thank you that uh, you call for the total devotion of our hearts. You don't want us halfway. You want us to be completely in con uh, surrendered to you, that you're in control of our lives. You're, we're living for your glory, to accomplish your purposes. And we pray that through our lives that you will be honored and magnified and glorified. And that that's why we're living. We're not seeking to gratify ourselves. We're seeking to glorify you. And with your head bowed and your eyes closed, as I had challenged you earlier on in, in this message, I encourage you this, uh, this morning, look at your life and evaluate it. Um, are you living to gratify yourself? Or is your real goal to glorify God? Um, just take a moment, pray about that. And I want to talk to those who have not yet accepted Christ as personal Savior. And if you're listening this morning and you've never yet taken that step of inviting Jesus into your heart and life as your personal Lord and Savior, would you do that today? Start that relationship with God that Andre Bitov did when he was riding through the metro there in Leningrad. And he experienced that life without God makes no sense at all. And that's true. You're finding it right now, aren't you? Life's not making any sense. Well, it will make sense if you give your life to Jesus and invite him into your life. You can invite him by a little prayer like this. Dear Lord, I admit that I'm a sinner. I believe you died on the cross for my sins. I ask you to come into my heart. Forgive my sins. Become my Savior. You pray that prayer and sincerely mean it. Mean it. Jesus Christ will come into your life. Lord, take this message and use it for your honor and glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. As we conclude our service uh, this morning, I'm going to play that song that uh, we began. Uh, listen to the words. I mean, I just love this song. It's got, got a real cheery tune to it. And listen to the words. And uh, as Mercy Me sings it, So Long Self. It's a great song. <laughs> It's just because I am Things just seem to feel A little bit different You understand Believe it or not But life is not apparently
Well, farewell, goodbye self. Um, I want to conclude uh, this morning the benediction uh, from 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17, where John writes, Do not love the world or anything that is in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful man, the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. And the world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. Well, I want to thank you for tuning in to our service this morning. Thank you, and may God bless you and give you a wonderful week.